Hello and welcome to The Voice of Iron, and in this session, we'll be reading Dreams of Rain, Tape 10. What was that? Mark shouted as we flew through the molten hole in the aluminoid exit door and out into the atmosphere of the pyramid. T2 ultraviolet mining laser, I replied, deploying starboard flaps and making a sharp turn to avoid hitting one of the taller buildings. We never saw anything like that in the initial scans. Where did you hide that? He asked, his hands clenched against the seat as we swerved. It's in the underbow, hooked up to the backup battery, I explained as I took a look beside us. The visage of Blue One was reflected off of the mirror-like glass of the pristine pyramid buildings, as was the reflection of the hover bikes chasing us. But why would you even need something like that? Mark asked, keeping his widened eyes on the approaching security bikes. Well, I thought I might run into asteroids at some point after I fled, so I began before Mark cut me off. Look out! He cried as a patrol car zoomed up from beneath us, forcing a 90 degree turn and a burst from her backup jets. That wall up ahead, near the shipping exit. I'm going for it, I declared, initiating the laser once more, watching the wall change slowly in color. 500 feet in closing. 400. 300. Mark counted down, his voice growing more and more strained as my smile grew wider and wider. Impact in three, two, one, he shouted, bracing as we shot through the new exit, scraping some of the sides on the softened hole's edge and out into the starry void. Don't ever do that again, Mark demanded as I laughed hysterically, retracting the laser and redirecting power to the thrust controls. No promises, because we're not out of the woods yet, I responded, plotting the shortest course to the southern end of the colony. The radio chatter exploded with security officers demanding that we halt, demanding our immediate surrender, etc. Behind us, five patrol astro cars followed in a V formation, attempting to fire small plasmic bursts to hit my engines. They were simple enough to dodge, especially given the immense maneuverability advantage we had. I had roughly twice the number of maneuver jets compared to the average patrol astro car. We'd be fine for now. Try zagging about. Vary your course, Mark recommended, elaborating as he started to relax a bit. Our patrol astrocars have a built-in course prediction system. It takes the average of a vessel's movements and plots the best course to catch up with it, or best intercept. You best believe they'll be calling another squad or two in a moment. I nodded with a smile, sending Blue One into a side spin and pitching from port to starboard, vertical and horizontal in an odd flow, one that would be hard to get a grip on. While doing this, I kept my eyes on the space ahead and the readouts from the dash, but I directed the rest of my focus to curiosity. So, why'd you do it? You got a nice promotion, you look set for life. Why throw it all out to help me? I asked, wanting to understand. I mean, we've been close friends for so many years, he began, but took one look at my unsatisfied face and sighed to himself. I know. It can't be that simple. And it isn't. He settled back, watching the scanners and ensuring our flight southward would be relatively unimpeded as he spoke. After I sent the information out and led the pursuit against you, I was brought back to the station and was told someone very important wanted to see me in the commissioner's office. When I walked inside, the commissioner wasn't there. It was Director Beckett sitting in his chair. This was surprising to me given that Upper Pyramid guys, especially the Director, rarely ever step foot down to Mid Pyramid, let alone talk to an Undercity Patrol Chief like Mark. Reading my expression, he let out an airy sigh. I know, I know. I was shocked too, but he gave me a speech about how proud he was of what I did. How proud he was that I put Asterisk first and got the bridge drive for him. He promoted me then and there, and told me that if I kept up selflessness like that, I'd make commissioner yet. Here he trailed off and stared blankly at the space beside us. And you know, that really hit me hard. All those things you said over the years about Astris using us the way they do. About us being just tools. I'm your friend, kid. And I gave you up to them. I put them first, just like he said. And as much as I'd like to be the perfect cop... I'd forgotten why I joined up in the first place. To help people. 
There was a moment of silence in the cabin, as another plasma burst dully exploded outside the window, and five more patrol cars showed up beneath us. I don't expect you to forgive me because of this, but I hope in some way that I've fixed my mistake. Apology accepted, old friend. I replied, bringing a smile, a genuine one, back to his face. That moment lasted about three seconds before a chilling message crackled through the radio. This is Officer Williamson to Blue One. We know you're heading, and you won't make it. Defense Force S3 is standing by at South Edge, ready to shoot you down again. There are at least 12 Astros patrol squads between here and there, and you'll have to fly past Novus to get there. You're outnumbered, outgunned, and even your fancy mods won't save you. So stop the Astro car, surrender immediately, and we'll only tack ten more years onto your sentence for this stunt. They expected this. How could they possibly have expected... Kit, I... Mark stammered, fumbling for words as I tried to figure out our options. Last time, I didn't think. That got me caught. This time, I needed to be clever. They set up a nearly impenetrable net for us in the south, knowing it was the only straight shot to Giu, and we can't go through the nebula... I said, spinning us about as a third squad began to fly at us from ahead. Mark remained silent as I looked out at the stars around us and remembered my astronomy. Mark, I... I have an idea, I said, blasting retros and spinning the bow about before thrusting full throttle northward past the pyramid. What are you thinking? he asked as I pointed my ship towards a patch of empty space and aimed for the brightest star. We can't get to Giyu, but that star right there, the Ignostos system, I think, it's about five light years away. He looked at me with mild shock, mixed with fear, as I continued. I... I can't ask you to take this risk with me. I can radio in, tell them that you're my hostage. We have at least three squads following us. You can take my spare suit from the back seat and I'll drop you off before I jump. You can keep your job, keep your life, and you won't have to feel any guilt. You made it up to me by giving me this chance. I delivered the plan with my hand, slowly reaching for the radio, an honest smile on my face. He looked at the patrol cars, getting further and further away behind us, desperately trying to make out what we were doing, before he looked back to me, placing his real hand atop mine, and moving it away from the console. I knew what I was doing when I set you free. He told me, quietly. I remind you that I have enough power for one jump. It might not even make it five light years, and we have no bridge tape. This tunnel will have to be manual, I explained, watching him intently. He stared back into my eyes and simply said, with a nervous gulp, Sounds fun. I admit, my eyes felt a bit misty as my cheeks rose in the happiest smile I'd felt in years. I nodded, and turned towards the star ahead. I flipped all safety switches to prepare for the jump, disregarding the no tape warning flashing across my screens. I looked at Mark one more time, seeing if he really was willing to go through with this. He laid his finger on the activation button and, taking a deep breath, we pressed it together and looked straight ahead as the system buzzed to life. We watched the nav screen struggle to generate the tunnel as I manually input five light years as the distance. It took its time forming the bridge, before detecting no major gravitational obstacles in the way. I shut off the thrusters and let inertia take us, as the drive formed the spatial envelope around Blue One and hummed loudly. The radio chatter was a blur of worried yelling and threats before all turned to static, and the whole cabin was filled with a low, vibrating hum. Finally, with one last look between Mark and I, the very stars around us stretched and changed, swirling into a whirlpool of blue and white. With one final flash, Novus disappeared behind us, and we were finally free. That concludes today's reading. Thank you for listening to this story, and as always, thank you for listening to my voice. <laughs>